Well, I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor Dirk Voorhoof, uh, recently retired from the University of Ghent in Belgium, but now working uh, in his own uh, consultancy, the Legal Human Academy, Academy, and consulting to the Council of Europe on matters of uh, media law advocacy. Welcome, Dirk. Welcome, Dirk. Mark. Dick, we talked today about freedom of expression and uh, drilled down into Europe and, and how, uh, how it mm -hmm. operates there. But, mm -hmm. but firstly, I've noticed uh, that there are all different levels of free expression internationally. And it seems different countries and different regions have mm -hmm. a range of approaches. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why there are so many different types of controls and levels of censorship over the media internationally? Well, I think the, the, the main reason that um, we have regulation and control um, on, on media is that at national level, some things authorities have the tendency to restrict, to restrain media. And at several levels internationally, uh, bodies have been created to control member states, whether they respect human rights in general and freedom of expression as a human right in particular. You could say the most global way of controlling how national authorities deal with this is the United Nations. The United Nations Human Rights Committee or the Council are in some way monitoring, controlling, if member states do sufficiently respect the rights of media and freedom of expression. That's the global level. But then you have also at regional level some systems, like for instance in Europe, in the Americas, in Africa now also, the African Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, who have developed systems within their region to control the national states. And I would say the difference with the UN system is that the enforcement goes a bit further. The, the UN has not real tools to enforce eventual breaches of freedom of expression. They can raise an opinion, they can have some political pressure, but not that much happens in some member states. European, African, Inter-American Court of Human Rights can find a member state violating a convention which is a legal binding instrument for that state, so the pressure can be a bit bigger. Although, at the same time, the weak point is that if a member state is not willing to secure the rights involved, like in Europe for the moment, what's happening in Turkey or in Russia or in Azerbaijan, although they are member of the European Convention, they have to respect the rights of journalists. They don't, to a large extent. And there's also a weakness of these international instruments. Hmm. Well, you're an expert, obviously, in the European situation, and uh, you're known as a dogged defender of Article 10. Uh, would you mind telling us what Article 10 is uh, and how it gets balanced mm. against other rights in yeah. the European context? Mm. Well, maybe to ring a bell, sometimes it's said that Article 10 of the European Convention is Europe's First Amendment. So it's the article in the Convention which guarantees that in all 47 member states of the Council of Europe, everyone should have the right of freedom of expression, which also means the right to forward and to receive information without interference by public authorities. So that's a very important statement in this, you could say, European constitution, where we recognize freedom of expression um, to such a large extent. It's not an absolute right. The article also recognizes in its second paragraph that sometimes interferences are possible or sanctions when it is prescribed by law, sufficiently precise, and when, and this is most important, when it is necessary in a democratic society to restrict or to curtail freedom of expression, freedom of the media, freedom of journalists. So the whole question is what is necessary in a democratic society in order to justify restrictions on freedom of expression. But the important thing is that the principle is freedom and only in very limited cases with a strong justification you can restrict 
or sanction that freedom. And that's why this Article 10 of the Convention became such an important instrument. Because according to the European Court, member states should be very reluctant, should be very careful in imposing limitations and restrictions of freedom of expression. And the proof is that the European Court, in hundreds of judgments, has found countries in Europe in breach, violating this article. So it means that the member states have to upgrade their level of freedom of the media, freedom of expression, and freedom of journalists. Mm. Obviously, we can't use freedom of expression and freedom of the media interchangeably because they are slightly different concepts, aren't they? Uh, what proportion of cases might be involved with general free expression as opposed to uh, journalists and mm -hmm. the media? Yeah. When you look at most cases the European Court has dealt with, these cases have been introduced by publishers, by broadcasting companies, by journalists, by academics, by NGOs, who all play a kind of an important role, you could say a watchdog function, about public matters in society. So it seems that this article, although it guarantees the right to every individual to freedom of expression, has shown to be very important for the media sector and for journalists and for NGOs to secure a higher level of protection, which they didn't get at the national level first and only at the last resort under the scrutiny and the control of the European Court. So it is an important instrument for mm. them. Your first comparison was with, it, with the First Amendment. Uh, so how, how strong is it compared with the United States First Amendment? Well, I think it, it's very strong. You have to compare it with what exists at the national level in the European states. And there it's very clear that over a period of, let's say, 30, 35 years, the European Court, with regard to several aspects which are crucial for public communication and media, has uplifted the level. And it, it is similar in many ways, and I would say in some areas even stronger than First Amendment protection. I give one example, protection of journalistic sources. In many countries in Europe, there was no legal protection and the judiciary didn't recognize such a right. It doesn't exist under the First Amendment in the US. But the European Court said, look, you can only have real freedom of expression and the right of the public to be properly informed if you have journalists and media who can work with information from all kinds of sources. These sources, in some circumstances, need to be protected. So you need a strong right for journalists to protect their sources. And at many occasions, the European Court found that member states had not sufficiently protected the sources, or didn't give sufficient rights to the journalists to protect their sources. So now, after this case law of 10, 15, 20 years, most member states have legislation now on protection of sources in line with the standards of the European Court. So that's an example that it takes some time, but it works, and sometimes even it gives a more extensive protection than the First Amendment. Mm. Uh, students also look at freedom of information uh, when they're looking at freedom of expression. Mm. And uh, you were explaining to me earlier that there have been some recent cases where Article 10 has even been ex applied to access to information. That is true, although during many years the European Court refused to recognise under Article 10 the right to seek or to have access to information because these words are not mentioned, these words are not mentioned in the Convention. But due to international developments and also a judgment by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the European Court was willing to make a shift in its case law and now in recent years it has explicitly recognised that it is an instrumental tool for media, journalists and NGOs to have access to information, to be able to play properly their, their role as public watchdog. So this is an enormous step forward with regard to the situation before, because what does it mean? It means that when public authorities are refusing access to journalists, to academics, to NGOs, 
And this refusal cannot be justified as really necessary in a democratic society. The court can overrule these national authorities and impose an obligation on them to reveal these documents or to hand over the requested documents by the applicants in, in these cases. So it, it gives an extra layer, layer of scrutiny because national states, security agencies, um, administrations are sometimes not very willing to apply the national law on access to information in the way that journalists or media would like to see it applied. And so the European Court can give that extra push to them to give more information, become more transparent, which is a very essential um, condition, I would say, in our democracies to become more transparent, to give information, uh, so that the integrity also of public authorities can be scrutinized by the media and so also by the people and the public who are reading these articles, who are looking at the reports broadcasted on these issues. Mm. Well, you also um, operate as a, a media advocate, taking on cases of different types uh, from time to time. Uh, what are these sorts of cases? Can you give me an example or two? Or it can be at different levels. Sometimes mm. I'm advising individual journalists who have a problem with the judiciary. Um, sometimes it can be at the European level, where we work together with some NGOs and some agencies in what we call giving third-party support. When, for instance, a journalist or a publisher brings a case to the European Court, it's quite a complex legal procedure and situation, so they get some legal support by us and by some agencies. That's another uh, example. That's in Europe, but it can also be outside Europe. For instance, um, um, in a case against Greenpeace Japan, where two staff members of Greenpeace were prosecuted because they had revealed information about embezzlement of whale meat and uh, let's say, participation of the government in covering up this embezzlement. In that case, two staff members of Greenpeace were prosecuted under Japanese law. And they, they were charged for theft and trespassing, although they had revealed something of public interest. So in that Japanese court case, we could bring in international standards, we are in your first question now also, to which Japan is bound under the UN or comparative law standards in Europe, which should also enlighten the Japanese courts to deal with this case. And the outcome was, with, with the whole community around Greenpeace International and some experts working on this case, that at the end, the two staff members of Greenpeace were only convicted to one year suspended imprisonment, while the risk was effectively that they should end up 10 years in prison if the normal Japanese laws would have been uh, applied. So sometimes this support by the international community and by referring to international standards can be very helpful to defend journalists, or in this case NGOs like Greenpeace, and to, to play their role as public watchdogs and to help that the public, the society, is informed about issues which really matter for society. Mm. Well, thank you for that. Your, your answer uh, took us back to the international perspective, mm -hmm. so, and I really appreciate that. You've given us a wonderful insight into that comparative free expression mm -hmm. uh, situation internationally mm -hmm. with a Japanese example, and mm -hmm. uh, you've given a wonderful explanation of the European situation. Thanks so much for sparing time from your Australian travels to speak to us today. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you.